Welcome back, everyone, to the real story of the Iron Claw Part 2. If you haven't seen Part 1 yet, what are you doing here? You should go watch that instead first, and then come back here. Ditto if you haven't seen the movie yet either. It's streaming now on Max. Just go, go do that. Seriously, it was an odd choice coming here first. Anyway, you know the drill by this point. Do the things to the buttons and check out the Patreon so you can get listed as a producer in the credits of my video and maybe get a shout out like my first patron, Rhett Top Potter one who is a realist of ones indeed. Thank you very much for the support, dude. If you want to help out the channel, that is the best way to do so, as I have not yet become big time enough to sell my soul to a sponsor like Raid Shadow Legends or NordVPN or some shit. So you guys suck each other's cocks, huh? I like crazy. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Thank you everyone, now let's get back to the sadness. That sounds like a Disturbed song. Oh, ah! William Shakespeare once said, expectation is the root of all heartache. And it's certainly hard to argue with Big Bill's assessment when we start looking at the youngest two Von Erichs. In the movie, Mike is portrayed as the creative and musically inclined, but physically frail and athletically challenged of the Von Erich boys, who Fritz was extra hard on due to his differences. Mike is shown to have no real interest in getting in the ring and is essentially forced into following in his brother's footsteps with the expectations of replacing David placed upon him. And that is mostly true. Like his on-screen counterpart, Mike reportedly was a wonderful musician, and as far as the wrestling business, his only real desire was to be a cameraman. But like many sons who just want to make their dads proud, he agreed to forego his own interest to pursue something he really didn't even want to do. Yeah, well, a lot of things are special, Dad. But you're a playmaker. <laughs> Not a singer. <laughs> How'd that get in there? Kevin maintains that while people remember him as not an athlete, that Mike actually did possess athleticism and performed well in sports. Standing 6 foot 2 and being billed as 230 pounds, it's not as though he was a small guy, but he had nowhere near the physique of a carry, or even Kevin, bearing more resemblance to a smaller, skinnier David. And while David was no Hercules, he had the height to show it better, and as we've established, he had the in-ring ability, which was another thing Mike simply did not have. It was obvious that he just didn't take to the movements or have the charisma with his body. He lacked the fireball personality of the others, so he really couldn't cut a promo. And I'm certainly not trying to speak ill of the dead, but many in the business have pointed out that Mike was also just not particularly quick on the uptake. And while his older brothers all embodied one of their father's distinct traits, the only tool Mike seemed to inherit from his old man that transferred to the wrestling ring was his last name. This meant he was not a prodigy as they had hoped, but rather a project at best that would need to be developed. Mike would make his in-ring debut for his father's promotion on November 24th, 1983, and in his early days was even part of a memorable angle involving his older brother David's quest for the NWA title. After Ric Flair degraded Mike's in-ring ability, David cut a fiery promo where he challenged the champ to get in the squared circle with his younger brother, and if Mike could survive 10 minutes, then David would be awarded a title shot with the stipulations of his choosing. The challenge was accepted, and Flair being the pro that he was made Mike look like a force to be reckoned with on route to surviving the time limit. David would never get that shot as we know, and when he passed away, it immediately thrust Mike into the spot of trying to fill in for his brother, being booked in high-profile tag matches with the Freebirds and being billed as the next star in Fritz's line of champions. In reality, while they certainly didn't want to boo him, the people saw through Mike and they didn't buy him as on the same level of his siblings. And while there was no question that Mike worked hard, it just wasn't translating at anywhere near the pace he was being expected for it to. Unfortunately, things would get worse as he would badly dislocate his shoulder in a match, requiring surgical repair. In the movie, it's a botched dropkick that causes it, but in reality, Mike was wrestling a match in Tel Aviv, Israel against Gino Hernandez in August of 1985, and simply moved the wrong way while Gino was holding his arm, which pulled it out of socket and tore several ligaments. Mike would receive surgery to repair his shoulder in an Israeli hospital and then boarded a plane back to Texas, but soon after developed a terrible staph infection at the site of incision. He was re-hospitalized at Baylor University Medical Center and his condition would soon turn into toxic shock syndrome, subsequently developing a fever that got as high as 107 and leaving him in a coma. It appeared as though Mike was on death's front doorstep as his organs started failing and the doctors told the family they should start saying their goodbyes because they did not expect him to make it through the night. 
with everyone tearfully gathered around, a man named Gary Holder, who was considered to be WCCW's official chaplain, gave an impassioned prayer challenging God to deliver them a miracle and slamming his Bible down on the table. According to witnesses, it was less than a minute later that Mike's blood pressure stabilized and his temperature began coming down inexplicably. No one can say for sure exactly how it transpired, but about one week later, Mike was able to be discharged home, and in the excitement of it all, the decision was made to have a big press conference about it shortly thereafter, a decision that aged like milk. We see this in the movie, and even though it's very accurately portrayed, you really have to see it in real life to grasp the sadness of this situation. I know, I'm, I know I'll be back. Uh, I can't wait till uh, the cotton ball show. I'm going to be there. Do you have a message for your fans? Uh, yeah, be at that cotton ball show if they want to see me uh, back for uh, the very first time. It became clear to anyone who saw him that Mike had been forever changed by what had occurred. His already lanky frame had been thinned down to just under 150 pounds, and he appeared somewhat confused with a faraway look in his eyes and an inability to collect his words when answering questions. The truth was, Mike had suffered severe brain damage due to the fever and coma, and he was never going to be the same person he was prior to the surgery. One thing we don't see, however, that is baffling still to this day even thinking about it, is that even after his brush with death, Fritz would push Mike to recover as quickly as possible in order for him to get back into the ring, which he ultimately did, parading him around with his new moniker, The Miracle. But if Mike wasn't setting the world on fire prior to all this, he really struggled with it after, often forgetting things due to his damaged memory, causing him to freeze up mid-match and during promos. He would suffer further head injuries in 1986 when he was involved in an accident where his car overturned, and he also had a couple of run-ins with the law at this time, at one point being acquitted for striking an emergency room doctor. Another notable time Kevin recalls is when Mike, in a state of despair over his condition and what was happening to him, drunkenly attacked a streetlight, which is just a heartbreaking thing to think about playing out. In his depression, he turned to drugs and alcohol heavier and heavier to cope, and in April of 1987, he would get arrested again, this time on suspicion of drunk driving and marijuana possession, and he would be bailed out quickly and quietly per the Von Erich method. But with the feelings of failure running heavy and the realization setting in that not only was he never going to be David, but he never may be himself again either, Mike's physical and mental state started deteriorating quickly. On April 12, 1987, overcome by his torment, Mike left his family a note and then set off for Louisville Lake nearby where the family lived. When he arrived, he swallowed a bottle of the tranquilizer Placidil and drank until he drifted off to sleep in his sleeping bag and passed away at the age of 23. His body would be found four days later and was described as lying there very peaceful, like you would go out for an overnight just to get away from it all. The way the movie shows us this event is symbolic and just so well done with Mike's flashlight being seen in the distant darkness while Kevin and Carrie argue and fight about in-ring matters and their positions amongst their father. The focus of wrestling taking precedent over the important reality going on in the background that they are oblivious to. Mike left another note that was found in his car nearby that read, Mom and Dad, I'm in a better place. I'll be watching. Mike's death understandably hit everyone hard, but perhaps no one more so than little brother Chris, as the two were reportedly closer with each other due to the differences in their ages from the rest. And this is where we will circle back to him like we mentioned earlier. Chris was different from his siblings in that also due to the age gap, by the time he was old enough to recognize what he was watching, his father's in-ring career was dying down and instead he grew up idolizing his older brothers, wanting to do what they did. In fact, it could be argued that none of the boys wanted to be a star in the wrestling business more than Chris did. However, the youngest Von Erich was also considerably the smallest of the boys, standing only 5'5 five five and weighing 175 pounds, which doesn't exactly preclude you from being a wrestler these days, but back in the land of giants and steroids, this simply was not going to cut it. Not only that, but he also had asthma and took prednisone for it, which made his bones brittle and made them more susceptible to injury. Wrestling was in his blood though, and Chris would end up doing camera work and other odd jobs while he was growing up, and like his brothers, he was heavily seen on his father's TV show, even getting to perform in the odd angle every once in a while. Undeterred from his dream, Chris would work hard on getting into the best shape he could and convince his brother Kevin to train him so he could finally get in the ring and live it. He would make his official in-ring debut on June 22, 1990. 
Because of his early exposure and since everyone likes to root for an underdog, the crowd seemed to look past his obvious glaring weaknesses and Chris was actually quite popular with the crowds early. Sadly, however, despite how badly he wanted to be a wrestler, the awful truth was he didn't have the physical capabilities needed and his body just couldn't hold up to the demands of it. It was actually Chris who would get hurt in the manner we see in the film, landing awkwardly after a dropkick and breaking his arm in only his ninth pro match. This injury was more than just a setback. It was a reality check from the universe, telling Chris what I'm sure he had heard being whispered around, that he had no business being in the ring to begin with. And as it set in that being a professional wrestler was likely not in the cards for him, and still reeling over the loss from his closest brother and friend, Chris turned to drugs and slid into a deep depression. On September 12, 1991, Kevin saw Chris sitting alone, as he often did, at the top of a hill near the family property. The two talked for a bit where Chris revealed that he had written a suicide note he had intended for the family to find. Kevin pleaded with him not to harm himself, and after a while he agreed and promised that he would not. At that point, Kevin left and returned to speak with his father about what had just taken place, and Fritz asked him to go retrieve Chris and bring him back to the house. Kevin then went back up to the hill to find his youngest brother had just shot himself in the head. Chris was rushed to the hospital, but was pronounced dead about 20 minutes after arriving. He was just 21 years old. To quote Oscar Wilde, there are two great tragedies in life. The first is not getting what you want. The second is getting it. Mike and Chris exemplify the former, both unable to achieve success in the manner they wanted to and becoming victims to the pressures of it. However, the latter is reflective of another brother who is discovering that achieving your dream and losing it may be far worse than never having it at all. So remember that coin flip for who was to take over David's title match after he died? Well, it might as well have been a double-sided coin because it was never in any sort of doubt who would be replacing him. However, the question was if it would still be happening at all. The vote to become NWA champion was not something that was passed down like an inheritance after all, and it was David that they wanted, so there was no guarantee that any Von Erich would be getting the title as they could just as easily keep it on established champion Ric Flair. But I think the coin flip scene is a nod to this portion of a real interview that Fritz gave around this time. I have no question. You both, you're all three, at some point in your professional lives going to have the world title. It's question now, which of you two is going to be the next world champion? Some have attributed what happened next to doing Fritz the favor due to his golden protege not getting a run with the belt. And some have said it was just the right place, right time, and the correct business decision in the aftermath of David's death. Whatever the case, the decision was made that a few months later, at the newly christened David Von Erich Memorial Parade of Champions, Kerry would be getting the call to face Ric Flair in the main event and win the NWA World Heavyweight title. While David might have been the best Von Erich overall, there was one X factor Kerry had that the rest of his siblings didn't. Something that made him more likely to be a star in the mid to late 80s, early 90s, and the brother chosen by someone like Vince McMahon. The muscles. Carrie had the look, and in the wrestling business, that can many times take you much further than in ring ability. But Carrie was built like a Greek god sculpted a statue of himself, and it positioned him to be the next in line. This isn't a big deal to me either because he did a great job in the role, but while we're on that topic, just real quick, even though Jeremy Allen White does bear a facial resemblance to Carrie and did a commendable job bulking up to accurately depict him, the one thing that is hard to not see is that he's still visibly smaller than Zac Efron's Kevin, and while Kevin was cut to shreds in his own right, he was nowhere near the size of his brick shithouse brother. Anyway, Carrie's date with Destiny came on May 6, 1984 in front of a packed Texas stadium, which was at the time the largest attendance for a wrestling event ever. We didn't really get to see this in the film, as its version of this day is mostly shown through Doris watching it on TV, with David's apparition watching from the stairs behind her, which is a nice touch, but this is a real shame because given the environment of the event, I think this would have been potentially an amazing scene. Whether out of sheer emotion of the day or due to the intense heat that was reportedly in the triple digits that day, hundreds of people ended up fainting and needing to be carried out. But that didn't deter the Texas faithful from cheering on their hometown heroes, as one of them was finally hopefully going to climb the mountain all in honor of their fallen brother. At one point in the card, a local girl got into the ring and sang a self-composed song called Heaven Needed a Champion 
which brought nearly the entire sold-out venue to tears. In the co-main, Fritz made a special comeback out of retirement to team with Mike and Kevin to defeat the Freebirds for the six-man tag titles in a wonderful nostalgia pop. All in lead up to the big main event where after an 11-minute match, Carey pinned Ric Flair to the mat with a backslide to a thunderous ovation. In what was a tremendously emotional and intense scene, tears flowed as the fans embraced and celebrated the victory like it was each of their very own as well. The rest of the boys spilled into the ring to share the moment with their triumphant brother, a storybook ending where it all felt right and for the first time in probably a while it seemed like things were going to be okay for the Von Erichs. 18 days later though, Carrie was flown to Tokyo and dropped the title back to Flair. This quick turnaround is speculated to have happened because he evidently missed his very first date after winning the title, and Ric Flair has said that even though the original plan was for a longer run, that this had given the NWA board cold feet about trusting their top prize on a guy who was quickly gaining a reputation as unreliable. Flair has also said before though that the plan was always for them to take the belt off as soon as possible, so who knows for sure. Regardless though, the truth of the matter was that Kerry's issues ran much further. Oh, tight, 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 yeah! He was becoming one of the more notable partiers amongst his peers, being remembered as one of the few people who could hang substance for substance with the infamous Roddy Piper, with Flair saying many times that you could line up all the big time partiers for an ultimate showdown, provide them all they could handle, and it would be Carrie and Roddy that would be the two left standing. Unlike Hot Rod though, when the lights came on and it was showtime, Carrie was not always mentally or even physically there to deliver. Flair has told a story many times, including in his book To Be The Man, which is excellent if you get the chance to read it, about wrestling an inebriated Carrie in early 1985. I got to the ring first and stood there about 10 minutes, waiting for Carrie. Nobody knew where he was. It was embarrassing. Eventually, someone looked in the cattle area outside the Coliseum and found him passed out in his Lincoln. When he finally did make it to the ring, I noticed that his boots were open. He wrestled for an hour with his laces untied. The first thing Kerry did was look at referee Dave Manning and ask if he knew where a certain girl was sitting. Hey Kerry, get a grip, I said. We got an hour to go here. Next, I had him shoot me off the ropes, lift me up, and press slam me. My fear was that in Kerry's state, he would drop me the wrong way, but to his credit, he was very safe. As the bad guy, I was supposed to beg off or roll out to ringside, but while I was laying on the canvas, I turned around and saw Kerry walking around in the front row. Where'd he go? I asked Manning. He's looking for that girl. Well fuck, get him back in here, I yelled. I'd estimate that things went this way for about 30 minutes with Kerry completely distracted and me trying to get his head into the match. During an attempted hip toss, my strategy called for him to stiffen up his body, then hip toss me instead, but he just kind of stood there, trying to figure out what was going on, and the two of us tumbled onto the canvas like a couple of kids. Another time, I was face down on the mat in a hammerlock, and Kerry was supposed to spring up and swing a knee down into my arm. Instead, he lost his balance, fell on his ass, and kneed me in the head. When he tried a sunset flip, he grabbed some imaginary person and rolled onto the canvas with him while I stood there, watching in astonishment. It all became so pathetic that I actually put myself into holds. I placed Carry in a figure four, then turned it over like he reversed it. And I fastened on a headlock, then took his hand and clamped it on my arm, while I ducked around making it look like he was powering out of the maneuver. Understandably miffed at the situation and also the prospect of being scheduled to have more matches with Carrie over the next month, when the time limit draw was reached, Rick stormed to the back and threw the NWA championship at the WCC booker Ken Mantell and shouted, Here, you work with him. To make matters worse, this match was taped and set to be aired on a big local network Saturday night show. In a state of full-on damage control slash enabler mode, Fritz would quickly arrange a story for the local news that Kerry braved a 105 degree fever in order to battle the champ and this was to explain his delirious state. The match we do get with Ric Flair in the movie is actually with Kevin and this is where I'm going to take a moment to shit on the one aspect of this movie that really did not work for me, which is the portrayal of Ric Flair by Aaron Dean Eisenberg. His cadence and his over-the-top Shakespearean delivery, it was atrocious. I mean, he couldn't even get Flair's signature woo right. Woo! 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 
has said in subsequent interviews that his focus was primarily on simply selling the gravity of the situation for the Von Erichs, and that he was not really going for an out-and-out -out impression of the Nature Boy, which is, I guess, good because it might have been one of the worst ones I've ever heard. And, you know, it makes perfect sense to put your own spin on the performance of one of the few wrestlers that nearly everyone can identify, even if they've never watched wrestling, rather than just delivering his natural charisma in the way people were expecting. That would be too cretinous for such a well-rounded thespian. What an idiot! Oh, what a loser! I will say, though, that I like the inclusion of Flair's promo on being a real man in the face of adversity, as it fits in with the commentary and message that the movie is delivering. Anyway, Carrie is said to have been disheartened by the quick dropping of the title and the response to his winning it in the first place, essentially being labeled as him getting handed David's title run that he wouldn't have merited for any other reason. He likely also probably understood there to be some truth to it, though, because while he looked like a rock star, he also played too much like one, and unless he could get his demons under control, he was never going to be trusted in that spot. And if that wasn't enough, another run with the gold was going to be near impossible to attain after what happened next. In the movie, it's presented as though Kerry, still riding high from his title win, goes for a ride on his motorcycle to try and come down a bit, and it's implied that he is involved in an accident that night, causing the loss of his foot and the loss of his one run as the champion. This actually happened a couple years later though on June 4th, 1986. Carrie was out riding and crashed into the back of a parked police vehicle, and while not life-threatening, it did leave him with a dislocated hip and a badly injured right leg that was described as looking like an alligator had chewed on it. Despite the severity of it though, the doctors performed surgery on Carrie's foot and were actually optimistic about his recovery. That was until, according to Kevin, he re-injured it trying to walk too soon, and this is what caused the necessity for the amputation. It's been suggested by many that Fritz was the primary one in Carrie's ear urging him back and pressuring him to move too quickly. Either way, Carrie would be out of action for a year and a half as he rehabbed and learned how to walk using his new prosthetic foot, a fact that he and the family kept secret from nearly everyone for years, with him going so far as to shower with his boots on so the boys in the back would not see his condition. The journey back to the ring and dealing with his new handicap would be long and arduous as we see in the movie, and the massive pain Carrie felt with during this time would see him adding an addiction to painkillers into his growing list of issues. His return to the ring would also ultimately be too late to be any sort of saving grace for the now fledgling WCCW. In the movie we see the decline subtly depicted and it is stated that business is down and things just hadn't been the same since Carrie jumped and went to Vince McMahon's WWF. In reality though, he was pretty much there all the way to the end, only leaving when he was essentially told to go because the writing was already on the wall and he should save himself while he can. Vince's McManifest destiny across the wrestling world had already begun, and his Walmart murdering small business style takeover of the business is something I could and likely will cover in a whole separate other video someday. But for the sake of time, all you really need to know now is that his methods and vision completely killed the territory days of wrestling, and WCCW was a casualty of that war. It's worth noting that Vince reportedly did offer to buy Fritz out for control of the promotion in 1984 as he wanted the Dallas market and as we mentioned before, he coveted signing Kerry, but when Fritz suggested a merger instead, Vince backed out of any sort of talks. And while it's likely they would have eventually succumbed to the WWF anyway, WCCW had such a vice grip on Texas and its people that it's very possible they could have existed much longer and gave some sort of actual fight along with the other holdouts like Jim Crocker promotions in the Carolinas. In fact, many argue that had Fritz been willing to cross the boundaries Vince McMahon ultimately did, that there is an alternate universe where they battle for decades for wrestling supremacy, but Fritz was just too honorable and Vince was the greedy son of a bitch who was willing to make that move. Uh, first of all, I, I resent your tone. But a fateful error in judgment on the part of Fritz would serve to be the beginning of the end. I want to touch on something that the movie only briefly nods to, but in real life was a much bigger deal with long-lasting repercussions, and that is the tale of Lance Von Erich. In mid to late 1985, while Mike was recovering from nearly dying, Fritz was troubled with much bigger issues such as who was going to take his place in the ring while he was away. He soon reconciled that if he didn't have a Von Erich ready to step into that role, well then by God he would just create one himself, and this would be the nexus for the introduction of Cousin Lance. In the movie he's played by AEW superstar Maxwell Jacob Friedman and only makes one appearance during a transitional montage where he refuses to tag Kevin into the match and takes all the glory of the win for himself, totally unlike anything MJF would do. You fucking mark! 
Max did say they shot another scene with him and Kevin, but it didn't make the final cut, which has me hopeful someday for a director's cut. Anyway, Bill is the son of Fritz's old tag team partner Waldo, who was coming to provide his extended family some backup. In reality, Lance was young Texas wrestler William Vaughn, who had been scouted as a talent by Fritz in 1984 and had been sent to gain experience in the Oregon Territory under the name Ricky Vaughn. Despite pleas from nearly everyone around him that this was a bad idea, the most vocal of which was evidently Kevin, Fritz was adamant on making Vaughn a Von Eric and pressed forward with his plans. But as so many promoters have found out the hard way over the years, wrestling fans are not stupid, we remember shit. And the WCCW fans saw right through the ruse of Con Eric. This deception was something their audience did not take lightly, and it painted the Von Erich family, who up to this point had been viewed as the ultimate upstanding good guys who could do no wrong, as liars. It also didn't help matters that when Lance unexpectedly jumped ship a couple of years ago over a pay dispute, that Fritz took to telling the story that Lance had conned all of them as well, and he was lying about being a real Von Erich the whole time, which approximately zero people believed. The damage had been done and there was no repairing the trust with the crowd, ultimately being the final nail in the coffin of any sort of comeback for the promotion. A perfect illustration of this tailspin can be seen through the dwindling attendance members of the Von Erich Memorial Parade of Champions event, as 1984 drew nearly 40,000 people to Texas Stadium, and by contrast, by the time the 1987 event rolled around, it drew 4,900. This is around the time they got the ESPN deal we mentioned earlier, and while it started off somewhat fruitful, the wheels soon came off, and rather than propping up the corpse of what was left of WCCW Weekend at Bernie's style, the network instead started airing matches and shows from the promotion's glory days nearly a decade earlier. In a pretty tasteless attempt to drum up some support, Fritz concocted an angle where he had a heart attack while helping his boys win a match with the Freebirds on Christmas night of that year. Stories were put out through the local news that he was not in good shape and could really use everyone's support, or in other words, Hey, please come see our matches and give us your money because it would really lift Fritz's spirits and you don't want him to die, do you? But many people saw through this charade and considering the real life tragedies that had befallen his family, manufacturing one for a cash grab completely tarnished what was left of the reputation he had been crafting for over a decade. The deaths of its major stars like David, Gino Hernandez, and Bruiser Brody had also taken a serious toll, and by 1989, there was no more avoiding the inevitable, and they would sell to Memphis promoter Jerry Jarrett, like what is mentioned in the movie, but Fritz wasn't threatening to disown Kevin in real life over it. In fact, Fritz made the final call, and it was Kevin who was against the sale. What was once a pillar of the wrestling industry for decades, and in another world could have ended up winning the territory wars, World Class Championship Wrestling came to an embarrassing end at the culmination of a company versus company angle where its representative lost a deciding cage match. The final show went off the air with the WCCW banner being pulled down and replaced with a USWA banner instead to a cheering crowd at the Dallas Sportatorium, the same place that served as base of operations and housed nearly all of its important history. A humbling conclusion. Kerry wrestled under the USWA banner temporarily, but as we mentioned before, left to join the WWF in June of 1990. He would be rebranded the Texas Tornado, and while they didn't hide his real name, they certainly didn't have it be his drawing power, possibly due to the negative connections it could have, and also because Vince legit possibly likely believed nobody would know who he was anyway. Nonetheless, Kerry's WWF career started out promising, with him shock winning their secondary title, the Intercontinental Championship, within the first couple of months like we see depicted. He was also being involved in major feuds such as with his old buddy Ric Flair, who had made his way to the WWF at this time as well. Many people don't know, but Kevin actually wrestled a non-televised match for the WWF in 1991 while Kerry was under contract, but he never signed a full deal for unknown reasons. Before long, Kerry's new toy smell had worn off, however, and he would soon find himself lost in Vince's vast toy box of talent, being relegated further and further down the card. Look! I'm the Texas Tornado. Howdy, howdy, howdy. His personal problems were also getting more and more difficult to deal with as he was arrested for trying to forge painkiller prescriptions in February of 1992, receiving 10 years of probation. His marriage had fallen apart as well, and his wife filed for divorce a few months later. After an attempted rehab stay and comeback fizzled out, Kerry was finally released from his WWF contract in August of 1992, and he kept going further and further adrift. 
When January of 1993 rolled around, he would find himself in trouble with the law again, but this time it was for cocaine possession. And there would be no getting out of jail free with this one as Papa Fritz had seemingly run out of favors to call in, and Carrie was looking at a likely prison sentence. Bret Hart has told the story that back as far as mid-1990, Carrie had remarked to him about wanting to join his late brothers in heaven, as he could hear them calling to him, but he was just waiting for God to tell him when the right time was to do so. Despondent by everything that had happened and feeling like he had hit rock bottom, Kerry likely saw this as the moment God was talking to him. On February 18, 1993, he drove to his father's ranch and after an embrace and telling his father, Dad, I love you, Kerry walked into the woods and shot himself in the chest where he died moments later. He was 33 years old and left behind two young daughters. In the movie's version, Carrie calls Kevin as he is mid-spiral believing himself to be the next victim of the curse and saying that he wants to die. Kevin then calls Fritz telling him about their conversation and that they need to get Carrie some help, to which Fritz replies, eh, just figure it out, I'm busy. Kevin did really speak to Carrie the morning of his suicide and he told his brother of his plans to which Kevin attempted to talk his brother down. He then did call Fritz who was in the middle of pouring new sidewalk and simply answered his phone with a, can't talk, call you back and in the short window of time before receiving the warning to keep an eye on Carrie, he had already shown up and done the deed. In the movie, Kevin gets to his father's home just in time to hear the gunshot and find Carrie dead, which he then has a very emotional, physical altercation with his father as they take turns blaming each other. This didn't happen though as Kevin was not there and Carrie was found by his father shortly after he had shot himself. It is depicted accurately, however, that Carrie shot himself with a pistol that he had originally given to Fritz as a Christmas gift two years prior. Next, we get the wonderful scenes with Carrie reuniting with his brothers in the afterlife, which I am not ashamed one bit to admit was the thing that finally gut punched me into tears. Just such a powerful scene. But just like that, within a span of less than 10 years, four Von Erich brothers had met sad, untimely, premature deaths leaving only one remaining to shoulder the burden of loss alone and to try to bring honor back to his family name. With his father's promotion now defunct and his brothers all gone, Kevin began distancing himself more and more from in-ring competition by the early to mid-90s. He did some work in various promotions here and there throughout this time, and even was an early mentor for a young man who would go on to become industry icon Stone Cold Steve Austin. But overall, nothing long-term, and he would officially retire in 1995. It's portrayed as though Kevin largely avoided any sort of the controversies that his brothers fell into, and while that's mostly true, he wasn't without his scares and questions as well. During an eight-man tag match in 1987, while routinely running the ropes, Kevin suddenly collapsed in the middle of the ring and began convulsing. One of his partners in the match hit the ring and started doing CPR, at which point Kevin came to. Reportedly, as Kevin was in the middle of this, many fans began taking pictures of what was taking place, and Bruiser Brody, being the ultimate protector of kayfabe he was, began knocking cameras out of hands and smashing them on the floor. As far as the explanation of why this happened, well, there was a few of them. The official story put out was that Kevin had been hit by opponent Brian Adidas with his crippling new move, the Oriental Tool Punch, which sounds essentially like WCC's version of We Have the Dim Mock at Home. The reasoning Kevin gave himself in an interview shortly after it happened was that Brian Adidas had run his head into the ring turnbuckle the wrong way and this caused a seizure and a concussion. However, the story is also out there that there was actually no one around Kevin when he had his in-ring episode and the prevailing theory is that Kevin had been partaking in extracurriculars before the event that night and what we saw transpire was related to that. It's also said that when Tommy Rogers, the man who administered CPR to Kevin, went to pick up his check from Fritz, that the old man remarked to him, Thank you for what you did for my son, but he didn't need any help. That guy's a dickhead. I also found a story involving Kevin that I wasn't able to gather the whole account of, or even if it is true, so take it with a grain of salt, but the rumor is he also allegedly accidentally ran over his first child with his truck, but it didn't result in her death and wasn't substance related. 
Either way, by several people's accounts who were close to him at the time, Kevin also struggled with drug issues, but that his use was more recreational in nature rather than as a coping device like Carrie, Mike, and Chris. The movie uses the family curse as a background evil force that Kevin begins to believe in and fear with the links he goes to in an attempt to protect his children, such as ensuring his child's last name is recorded as Adkisson, and also living away from them for long periods of time at the Sportatorium. However, in recent years' interviews, and even as far back as one done in 1987, shortly after Mike's death, Kevin has stated that he does not believe in a family curse and that what happened to his family was just a string of awful tragedies. What is it with you and curses? Yeah, I'm happy without a good curse. This is curse. That is curse. Fritz himself also dissuaded any talks of a curse as well when he was asked in 1994 about it. I felt like there had to be some reason for all this. It kept happening. But as far as a curse or anything like that goes, I, I can't swallow that. As for whether or not I believe in the curse, I guess that depends on the meaning. I don't believe in a Papa Shango style spell put on the family out of vengeance as the story goes, although I'm ambiguous on whether or not a person could be quote unquote cursed with an unlucky soul. I think it's undeniable however that the real things that primarily had hold of this family were drugs, pressure, and mental illnesses. Either way, for Fritz and Doris, who in the end had to suffer the unimaginable sorrow of outliving five of their six children, the wounds were unhealable as far as their union as man and wife. Their last scene together in the movie shows Fritz coming in from working out in the field, clearly expecting his obedient wife to have dinner ready like always, but instead she is painting without a care in the world as to what her husband thinks or expects. Its symbolism is nice, and even if they don't outrightly show it, you get a sense that things will never be the same, and in reality, they actually divorced on July 21st, 1992, in between Chris and Carrie's deaths. Doris reportedly blamed Fritz for the absolute destruction of their family, believing that he had pushed them too hard into a perilous business and had failed to protect them from the evils of it. She never blamed me, but now she blames me. She says now that I'm the responsible death of all my children. You can't blame him. I didn't come from a dysfunctional family. You just can't blame And then it, it, it's, it's cruel, too. And that brings us to the much-debated examination of Fritz's role in everything. The movie paints it as though he pushed David too hard and put too much pressure to be the champion, possibly causing him to ignore clear signs his health was deteriorating. He advised Carrie to wrestle and ignored clear signs that he needed help and was spiraling. He pushed Mike into the ring when he was ill-equipped for it and wanted to do something else that Fritz deemed not worth the time. And while some of those things might be very true, it's worth noting that Fritz and his relationship with his sons was certainly more complicated than the uber-masculine, overly competitive, glory-obsessed portrayal we get in the movie. While I understand why they focus so heavily on these aspects due to time restrictions, some of the other things I would have liked to have seen were the links gone to cover up his boy's issues, and also the enabling slash denial of some of them. As far as the pushing his sons into the business reputation he has garnered over the years, while it's deserved when it comes to Mike for pressuring him into the ring initially and then certainly back into the ring after his injury, when it comes to Kevin, David, Carrie, and Chris, it is almost universally recognized by the guys they work with that they wanted to follow in their father's footsteps. However, even though he might not have pushed his sons into the ring, once they were there, he most definitely hammered in that anything less than being at the top was simply not enough. They've been raised with second place being last. They have been raised to take titles in wrestling. These boys, since they were six years old, they've been preached to Kevin, to David, to Kerry, to David, to their brothers Mike and, and Chris, that to bring home championships. Always remember, if you ain't first, you're last. One thing the movie does mention that I want to elaborate on is when Kevin discovers after going through the books that Fritz has been underpaying him for nearly his entire career. When he confronts him on this, his father basically says, living here wasn't a free ride and he always did what was right. This depiction is true and many have pointed out over the years that Fritz maintained a very tight grip on his kids even after they had matured and part of this control was intentionally underpaying them as a means to keep them dependent on him. Even after the older boys got married and were starting families, none of them lived much more than a mile from their parents' home. There are people on both sides of the aisle ultimately when it comes to Fritz being the main driver of his family's misfortune, 
and while he played a large part in it, likely never to be winning a Father of the Year award, it's certainly not all on him. Kevin maintains that people like to beat up on his father for destroying his sons, but is quick to shut that down and reinforce what a good man he was and how much he loved his kids. Which, far be it for me to question the one person left who actually lived it, but the analytical side of me also says he's the one with the most reason to protect some shred of his father's reputation, so who knows really. What is known is that Fritz and Kevin's relationship was understandably strained towards the end, compounded by an intense encounter that happened when a grief-stricken Fritz told his son that he would kill himself too if he had any guts like his brothers. Kevin's response to his father was, Dad, it takes guts to live, not guts to die. Fritz then pointed his rifle at Kevin and asked if he was afraid, to which he replied, No, sir. Fritz had a mild stroke in the summer of 1997, and in the process of being treated for it, it was discovered that he had lung cancer that had already spread to his brain. He would die in his home about six weeks later on September 10, 1997. And Doris lived a quiet remainder of her life, passing away in 2015. The movie closes out with Kevin sitting and crying as he contemplates all of the loss he has endured, and when his boys who are playing nearby notice, they ask him what is wrong. Kevin apologizes to them saying that they shouldn't see him like this and that men don't cry, to which they reply, that isn't true, which I love that it's pointed out through the innocence of even the kids know that it's okay to cry. It's an obvious rebuttal on the toxic masculinity issue and the just be a man and deal with it that has become our gender's credence for as long as time. It's a touching scene and in it, movie Kevin says something close to an effect that real life Kevin has stated in the past. Normally I wouldn't quibble about something so small, I just think the actual statement is sadder. I used to have five brothers, now I'm not even a brother. In the movie we only meet Kevin's two sons Ross and Marshall, but he and Pam actually had two daughters prior to them named Kristen and Jillian who are not mentioned. As for Ross and Marshall, they would end up growing up to follow into the family business after all, becoming a tag team performing simply under the name The Von Ericks. The boys are sometimes accompanied to their matches by their proud daddy who occasionally slaps the claw on someone trying to do a run-in against his sons, and Kevin actually came out of retirement in 2017 for a one-night comeback to tag with his sons in a match in Tel Aviv, Israel. Ross and Marshall also just recently made their AEW debut back in December of 2023, the same month the Iron Claw released. They're not the only third generation Von Erichs to make their way into the wrestling business either, as Carrie's daughter Lacey also had stints in places such as TNA, but she retired back in 2010. The movie then ends with some updating information, such as the Von Erichs family's induction into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2009, of which Kevin was there to accept on all of their behalf, and as a cherry on top, was presented by his old Freebirds rival Michael P.S. Hayes. Kevin and Pam are still together after 40 years, and they have a wonderfully big family that has all moved to the amazing ranch they bought in Hawaii, where Kevin seems as though he has finally found peace with all that he has been through, saying, They say the Pacific Ocean has no memory. Well, here I am smack dab in the middle of it. In an interview with Slam Wrestling some years back, Kevin told the interviewer, A radio station called me right after the 9-11 tragedy, when the towers went down. Like, I'm an expert on grief. And they said, how do you deal with it? How do you get over it? I hate to bum everybody out, but the fact is, grief doesn't ever get any better. I would certainly agree with that sentiment, but I would also like to add that while grief doesn't get better, you get better. And if time heals all wounds, and the Pacific indeed has no memory, well then it would appear that Kevin Von Erich is in the perfect place, at the perfect time, to have done just that. That's going to do it for this one, folks. What did you think? Let me know in the comments, and if you have a request for a movie you'd like me to give the real story on, feel free to request it, and I may just do it. Also, if you enjoyed the video, do the things to the button so you won't miss what's coming next. It's something I've been promising for a bit. Thank you all for watching. Be safe and happy, and I will see you on another time. I am no pervert. Uh.